Hello everyone and welcome. I'd first like to start by acknowledging that the land on which we're based is the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of New Credit First Nation, the Haudenosaunee, the Huron-Wendat, and home to many diverse Indigenous peoples. We honor all the First Nation, Métis, and Inuit people, and the Indigenous, Maori, and Aboriginal people across your respective regions who have been living on the land since time immemorial. Welcome everyone, my name is Jessie Wong and I'm CEO's Director of Activator Growth. And on behalf of the CEO team in our community, we are so excited to welcome you to our CEO Learning Lab on the topic of how women hire. We'd love to hear where you're joining in from, so please type into the chat box within Zoom and let us know where you're joining from. For those who are new to CEO, I'd first like to start with a quick overview of what we're all about and how it works. So at CEO, we are a global community of radically generous women transforming how we fund and support women-led ventures. And today you'll have a chance to hear from four of our incredible CEO ventures about how they hire and their social hiring practices. Within the CEO model, each year, hundreds of radically generous women who we call activators each contribute $1,100 or 850 pounds in our newest region, the UK. And all of that money is pooled together and loaned out in the form of interest free loans to women led ventures whom the activators help select. And each year, as the money is paid back into the fund, the money is loaned out again to support more and more women led ventures who are changing the world. And so we're really excited to have you join us today. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to be here. Over the course of the next hour, here's how it's going to work. We're first going to have a panel discussion of about 40 minutes long. And then afterwards, we'll have about 15 minutes to do live Q&A with the incredible ventures on the simulcast today. And so feel free as you're listening to the ventures share their stories, feel free to type your questions into the chat box. We'll be compiling them and then we'll get a chance to hear from the ventures at the end of the session. Today, our host, we are very lucky and grateful to have one of our CEO activators, Komal Minhas, who will be hosting today's Learning Lab. She is an activator based in Ottawa in Canada. Komal is an Indo-Canadian speaker, media maker, and investor. She's the founder of Comedia, a media production and investment company that focuses on amplifying inclusive, diverse stories, events, and companies. Komal was named one of Oprah's Super Soul 100, a list featuring extraordinary individuals who live life intentionally. We are so grateful to have Komal be our host today. Now I'm going to turn it over to Komal to introduce the ventures and why we're here today. Over to you, Komal. Hey everybody, I am so grateful to be joining today. Um, I recently joined the CEO community about two months ago and it's been incredible to see the enthusiasm, the vibrancy and the just beautiful community that has been brought together around CEO. And we're so excited to be doing this conversation today around hiring, social impact hiring. And on today's panel, we have Hannah Cree from Common Good based in Calgary, Alberta. We have Sheena Russell from Made With Local from Dartmouth, Nova Scotia. We have Emily Bland from Succeed in St. John's, Newfoundland. And we have Sarah Gunn from GoGo -Go Events in Adelaide, South Australia. So I wanna welcome this panel and I want to start uh, by having them introduce themselves because they are the best to do so um, by sharing a little bit about your ventures and what inspired you to start the businesses that you are in now. And I'd love to start with Hannah, if you would. Hello, everybody. I'm so excited to be here. I'm Hannah Cree of Common Good. And what we do in our model is that we take our restaurant's food waste and uh, we bring that back to our, to our warehouse. And what we do is we turn that into biofuel energy and that actually heats our water. And what we do with that water is that we wash all of the linens from the restaurant. So chef jackets, napkins, uniforms. And who does all of that work are people that are coming out of homelessness that are faced with incredible poverty barriers. And we provide on the job training, mentorship and an equity wage. And so that's kind of what Common Good is and how that started for me is that we went through the 2013 Calgary flood. It was devastation. There was 100,000 people without homes, um, all right downtown. And as I was going through it, we lost, uh, we walked out of our home. We were knee deep in water. And we walked out with my cat in my purse. 
And, and at the same time, our local homeless shelter is also being evacuated. And I just had this moment and we had volunteered there for years. And I had this moment where I was like, yes, we're walking out of our house with our kids, but people who already don't have a home are being misplaced and the trauma that happened there. And so after we rebuilt, we had an outpouring of support. We had so many people, we had, I had 17 strangers in my house pulling things out at one point. I was overwhelmed. I'd only lived in Calgary for a couple of years at that point. And uh, what we did is we gave back after we finished rebuilding and we ended up in the homeless shelter downtown Calgary. And what we kept on hearing as we were working there over years was, listen, I've taken all the courses. I've done what they've told me to do to get out of this system and I can't get out. No one will take a chance on me. No one will give me that shot at, at employment. And we really, as entrepreneurs, both myself and my partner, Dave, saw a, a cog, a missing piece in our system that, you know, a lot of times people still don't have ID or a bank account, all of those different pieces. And we needed to help with those pieces and provide um, and provide a different model. So we looked we knew of this model. Uh, my partner had a, 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 an experience actually being homeless for one day about 13 years ago that really altered his life and why he came in it. And we, there was a model in Toronto that was doing something similar in laundry, but they weren't making any money. It was a charity model. And we knew this industry was a highly disruptable industry. There's big people in here making billions of dollars literally in our industry. So we knew that we could use this model to employ people and do something good, like do good with capitalism. That's what we ultimately wanted to do. Incredible. And thank you for sharing the story of what was a heartbreak for you and how you were able to turn that for your community into something so meaningful. Um, next up, could you share with us, Sarah, your story? Sarah, we'll need you to unmute your mic, please. <laughs> Are we there? Hi, everybody. It's lovely to be here. Uh, I'm uh, speaking to you from Melbourne, um, Australia, where it's cold and wintry. And uh, but actually, my business, Go Go Events, is based in Adelaide, which is about uh, eight hours drive from here. Uh, and I'm here for a social enterprise conference. So. Um, my business is Go Go Events. So it's an event management and design company. And um, uh, we design and manage events. Uh, of all scales from reasonably small to really huge. And um, all our uh, employees, uh, other than our really core team, our ops manager and myself are people who uh, have a lived experience of homelessness, um, are currently homeless or are avoiding homeless um, homelessness. So uh, how we came to be was uh, I'd run a normal uh, for-profit company for 12 years, started in 2000, got to 2012 and um, realised, you know, I was feeling really empty in the work I was doing because I could see, uh, I was aware of the time and the money and the energy that goes into creating these big events uh, for, for our corporate clients um and then uh, of course as a good event manager you there's nothing left the day after um because you're all packed and clean and highly organized and i um you know that that nothingness that was left the day afterwards really was resonating with in my heart and i thought some these lead, these events need to leave a legacy behind and what could that legacy be um and over you know, a period of a few months of questioning that, I thought this could create employment for people. Um, I uh, I have a brother who through um, trauma and then addiction and several other things has had a journey of homelessness in his life. And I was aware that, you know, perhaps if there was an, um, a, a, a net that caught people before they fell into homelessness or before their life, you know, just spiraled out of control that, uh, you know, there was a mechanism to pick them up. So like you, Hannah, it was an opportunity to say, how can we make capitalism work? So we basically, um, on the strength of a couple of really strong relation, corporate relationships where I'd been running their events for, you know, many years, I went to them and said, this is, how we're going to do business now. Your events are going to create employment outcomes um, for the homeless. And that was that was about seven years ago. And we've 
uh, we've managed to master that model. We've managed to create impact. We're just a very small business, but we've had 85 people that we've supported on their journey out of homelessness. And we've got some great academic research to suggest, or to, to prove to us that this method works. Um, I think we're gonna dive in a bit deeper to that a bit later. So that's, that's my intro. Thank you so much, Sarah. Next up, Emily, could you share with us? Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Emily. I grew up on a small farm in central Newfoundland, so grew up where agriculture was always all around me. I uh, went to university, and then I was at the time that a lot of the food insecurity stats were coming in from northern communities uh, in Labrador and across Canada, and they, they broke my heart. So I was a part of a volunteer organization called Enactus, and there was a group of us who were watching these figures come in that the government was spending millions and millions and millions of dollars to grow produce in outer space, but there was a huge part of our country that had been forgotten and people weren't focused on providing fresh vegetables and helping them grow. So we came together as a team with what we thought was a lofty volunteer project idea of building 15 indoor hydroponic gardens that could allow people in rural communities to grow fresh produce anywhere. So started off with that goal. An article went out in the local newspaper in Newfoundland. And in 24 hours, we had people across Canada and the States reaching out, emailing us, wanting to buy the gardens that we were creating. So these gardens allowed people to grow fresh produce anywhere for less than 30 cents per day and do it all within your home without any mess, no dirt, no nothing, no fuss. It was an easy way to provide for yourself and your family. Um, at that point, we had had professional engineers build our initial prototypes, but we realized that there was a bigger opportunity here to have even more impact than we ever thought possible. So we partnered up with a local nonprofit called Choices for Youth, worked with youth between the ages of 16 and 28 and said, hey, we have 100 customers who want to buy these. Can we build them together? And then we built in a profit margin that allowed us to donate those 15 units uh, to Northern Labrador. And then things started to scale. Um, we started signing multi-million dollar partnerships with national organizations around food security, um, healthy eating, teaching in the classroom, and really realized that there was a huge amount of people around the world that cared where their food was coming from and wanted to be a part of it. So it continued to grow. We transformed from a student volunteer project to a standalone social enterprise, all fueled from wanting to just help the world grow. Wow, that's truly phenomenal. Every, every time each of you tells their story, I'm just like, this is why we're part of this community and this is why your work is so crucial and I'm so grateful we're having this dialogue. Um, Sheena, would you like to share with us with your little baby with you? <laughs> yes, so it is bedtime in Nova Scotia right now, hence my little <laughs> partner in crime here. Um, super happy to be here. Thank you guys for having me. Um, our 2017 CEO venture, and our company creates simple, nourishing uh, snack foods, mostly bars, um, out of uh, local ingredients, of course, but also in partnership with social enterprise bakeries. So unlike some of the other companies here, our, um, our evolution into partnering with social enterprises was something that came a little bit later in the life of the business. So we, uh, I started as a little farmer's market table in Halifax. With a friend, we were just making bars at a friend's cafe after hours, bringing them to, this, to the farmer's market here in Halifax. And, um, you know, it was a little side hustle that soon for me turned into something, um, you know, that I became very passionate about. But I became pregnant with my daughter, my older daughter in 2014. And um, a few months into that pregnancy, I was literally like, my belly was in the way. I could not even roll the bars out anymore. I couldn't bake them anymore because I was too pregnant. <laughs> there was just not enough space in front of me to be able to do the, the production work that I needed to do. So um, like a complete, you know, serendipitous, amazing phone call that came out of nowhere uh, from a woman at a social enterprise here in Nova Scotia asked me if we happened to need help doing our production. And I was like, oh my God, yes. I cried, of course, because I was very pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> and very grateful for this opportunity. So in the beginning, um, it was really just something that we needed in that moment was co-packing support. And that initially, and I'm very open about this, obviously, was all I intended for this relationship to be. 
but I went in there and, and uh, into the social enterprise the Annapolis Valley, Nova Scotia, called the Flower Car Group, and um, soon realized how special this organization was and the impact that this organization has on their community, and the impact that then Made With Local could have on the community by um, ensuring that all of our bars were made, you know, within their four walls. So I had a major aha moment uh, in those early days of training them how to make our products and um, soon after really committed saying, you know what, this is, this is going to be the path that we go down. Um, and that was in 2014. So today, now, uh, five years later, we have three different social enterprise production partners here in Nova Scotia that employ uh, or help to employ and train over 100 Nova Scotians living with barriers to the mainstream workforce. Again, truly incredible. And I want to just riff off of something that both yourself and Sarah shared, and that being that you were for profit companies first, or, you know, started as small businesses first, and you transitioned into social impact hiring. Can you share a little bit about how that switch changed your relationship to your business? Um, did it deepen your experience with your business? Sarah, could you could you share? It completely changed it, my whole life, in fact. It, it took my life on a completely dis different trajectory. Um, and what it meant for me was I had, a, I had a whole other purpose and the business was a, was a means to deliver um, an opportunity for myself and my family, uh, my clients and all the relate business relationships we had to find a deeper purpose in what we were doing. Because when I transitioned, it, it, the transition came about because I was, I didn't want to go to work anymore. You know, I was really, I was thinking, you know, I need to go and get a different job. I can't, I can't do this anymore. And really I'd worked for myself for a long time. I, I thought I was unemployable. So, um, <laughs> so <laughs> I a lot of us entrepreneurs do at that moment, right? <laughs> <laughs> it was kind of sink or swim. So, um, uh, so it did. And, and now I have found, um, to be really honest, I've been caught up ever since then in this amazing personal growth, business growth, um, you know, um, uh, I've learned so much. I've, I've been recognized for my work. I've been, you know, introduced to amazing organizations like CEO that are changing the world globally. Um, and to be honest, I don't, I don't know when it's going to stop. It's like a rolling ball of consciousness and, and, and it's not just my journey. It's become a journey of all those around me. And, um, and I know there are, you know, I've got some friends and my board are listening in on this webcast. You know, I think we have an opportunity to really change the way the world thinks about business. And I'm not the first person to think that. There are schools of thought globally around that. But, um, yeah, it, it's the beginning, I think, of the, the step change in, uh, in where we want the world to be. And uh, this is just one mechanism, our little bit of the puzzle that fits together. And when I say we, I mean all, all of Sheena. Hannah, Emily, everyone. Yeah. I find that so inspiring to know that we can be in business for so long and then suddenly realize that there's a way for this to be so much more deeply connected to our purpose in the world and the legacy we want to keep in the world. Um, so Sheena, I'd love to throw to you here about your experience with that transition from I'm building this business and it had such meaning with the way that you were creating the bars and the food that you were creating, mm -hmm. but then deepening it with this, this new social impact hiring. Yeah. And, and like I said, it was something that happened, um, kind of by accident, <laughs> the pregnancy and, uh, the, <laughs> the <move into> <laughs> Which I would also like to say, I probably would have cried in that moment also. I don't think it was just because you were pregnant. <laughs> oh, man. Anyway, it's all good. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, for me, I, it, it gave me that much deeper sense of, of why. You know, what is your why? Why are you doing what you're doing? And I know that, you know, there's lots of folks and probably mostly men out there who have a why that revolves around the dollar sign. But for me, it was always... Um, you know, to, to make a difference, much like Sarah said, business can be used as a force for good. We, we you know, and, and that's a tagline that's used also by the B Corp movement of which we are part two. Um, 
But yeah, I mean, it's just something that I, I had those butterflies. I had that like aha moment where you just know that um, you are on a path that you're meant to be on and you can't deny that feeling. Um, you can't, uh, you can't ignore that. So it just felt like we had discovered something really special and that we had innovated a model that wasn't happening anywhere else in Canada or to this point, I can't find any other snack bar companies that, that run their companies like we do. So that was a really exciting uh, thing to discover. And of course, in the early days, when we started partnering with social enterprise, I would get a lot of feedback from bigger business people, um, more seasoned business people who would say, Oh, but you can't scale. Like you can't scale doing business like that. And we've totally proved them wrong, which feels amazing. So <laughs> I love that. And I want to build on that. Uh, Emily, you, you also talked about scaling and how quickly that happened for you and how the resonance was so deep with the business. Um, can you share a little bit about what that experience was like and the impact it had on those you were working with and hiring? Yeah. At the first couple seconds of it was honestly scary. We were sitting there, a group of volunteers, and watching my email box just continue to grow and grow and grow and grow. Uh, we continued to read the messages, and it was that feeling of, okay, this is something special. This is an opportunity in life that doesn't happen often, and it's our duty to do something incredible with it. So for us, scaling has been done so closely with our partner, Choices for Youth. We've worked with them from day one. We have calls with them weekly. Um, they're really tied into everything that we do, and it's been all about building this together. So when we do our forecasting, they're in the room with us. They're working through those numbers. We help build out processes and structures so that we can continue to scale and grow while continuing to provide these supports. And a lot of it for us has been having that right, perfect partner who's in it with you, going to support you through it and working through that process together. Mm. And Hannah, can you share with us how the, the impact this has made? Because that moment for Calgary was massive, the flood, and this being such an impact-driven outcome that you created with your partner and with his experience with homelessness. Can you share a little bit of maybe like an anecdote or a story from one of the people who has worked with you and, and the impact made through what you've done? You know, oddly, right before this, as I was walking down the street from my office, I ran into one of, uh, one of the first three employees. Wow. Um, and, uh, and, and like really crazy moment actually. And I think, you know, for me is uh, the one that really comes to mind is Daryl. And Daryl would have been really one of our first. And uh, he's a great example that he had put out literally hundreds of resumes. He's been sober for a year, but he's still living in a homeless shelter. So he doesn't really have an address, uh, but he's done everything. He's taken, you know, the certification courses and all these things that are set up to say, if you do this, then this will happen. But the truth of the matter is, is that, you know, once they've been in the system, even in the homeless shelter system within two years, they're institutionalized and it's really difficult to get them out. And so when we um, hired him, he was so excited. And uh, typically we don't know their stories. We don't know any of that because it takes time to get to know one another. It, you know, quite often we sit down to someone who's facing homelessness and say, hey, how'd you get here? What happened to you? And, and it's like, no, you say hello first. And how are you doing? And what does this look like? And so we didn't really know his story. But here he was, um, you know, he just worked away. He was one of our hardest workers. And in, at the three month mark, I got this picture, a text picture, a picture of just, we always get this actually a pan on a stove with food in it. And I was like, what, where are you? Like, what's happening? And he's like, I got my own place. He didn't even tell us. He took all of that money. He took the money. He was saving it. He was doing that. And he went out. He found a basement suite. And he had his own place and making his own meal. And he did that on his own. And we just gave him a job. Like, truthfully, we gave him a job. And, and we said, we're going to take a chance on you. And why wouldn't we? You know, you know, like, he's done everything that he needed to do. But for me, where Daryl's story, where I always get emotional, is that he went to a local grocery store and a bunch of probably they were in their 18 20s 
and uh, he still looked the part of being homeless, right? You've been on the streets for a long time, your skin, the worn outness, like everything. And uh, he was beat up for looking homeless. And sorry, it's been a while. And so I think about those moments and that sent him back, right? He didn't show up to work, all this trauma. And then when we were able to sit him down, what we found out was that he had, it came out, he had never told anyone, but he had gone through incredible trauma as a child through sexual abuse, never talked about it. And all these mental health issues just kept on coming up because we're not dealing with the core of the issue, which is the trauma that these people have gone through, whether it's death or abuse or loss of job. And that's what we need to start looking at is the trauma. Um, they are not there because they're alcoholics. Those are all just symptoms of the issue. It is the trauma that we need to start looking at. And uh, Daryl, because of that, it finally came, that was within a year and a half, like that's how long this takes. Um, we were able to put him in and get him the medication he needed and, and the support and the counseling. And actually now to the point where, you know, um, but it's still, it's a long journey, right? So just giving someone a job is actually just one step. We still have a core of mental health issues that we're not even addressing as a society, let alone in homelessness and poverty. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for sharing Daryl's story. And you got me emotional over here. And I think a lot of our I audience cries. <laughs> me too. I'm a big crier. I feel my feelings all the time. <laughs> um, and I would love to know because with the type with social impact hiring, with this type of hiring, as a manager, as an employer, your EI has to be, your emotional intelligence has to be present, your empathy has to be present. And I deeply believe in empathy-based leadership, leading with your heart, being open to your employees, helping guide them through their own traumatic journeys and experiences. And I think that this can be a challenge for people who are trying to, who, who maybe try and think about social impact-based hiring. What suggestions do you have for people who are maybe thinking of taking this leap but knowing that there is there is a, a different different set of challenges that may come with social impact hiring. This for you, Hannah, and then we'll, we'll go across as well. Uh, so there's two things. A, you just need to have a lot more grace with people. I think we need to have more grace with people, just any employee and the people that are coming to the table. Uh, you definitely need to have that grace and that openness and know that, you know, I, I was talking to one person and they said, you know, 27 days of the month, they're great, but they freak out for, they're the hardest person to work with for these five days. And you have no idea what triggers it or what it is, but you kind of, you kind of have to be able to do that. But I also think partnering, you know, we're not just hiring people. Like a lot of people are like, how are you taking someone off the street? And it's like, no, we're working with local organizations that are in these systems. And we're saying, who are the people who are trying to get out? They've taken all the courses. They're, they're, tr you know, they're doing everything in the system. So, you know, work with it. And also, you know, make sure that it makes sense with your model. Don't just do it because everyone's doing it, but it has to make sense to your model. You need to have that revenue piece and uh, pair with the experts and also live it. Like we volunteered at the shelter for years before we ever started this. You really do need to, this is the crux of it, eh? If we're big superheroes trying to solve all these problems, we're actually working in the I think we may have lost Hannah. Um, we'll wait for her to join us again. That was a good cliffhanger, I will say. Um, we'll come back to the crux of the problem. I'm gonna bring this question over to you, Sheena. Um, what challenges or different set, oh, we've got Hannah back. Hannah, we lost you. No, don't worry. Um, we actually can't hear you just yet, but let's give it a try. You were mentioning the crux of it. Uh, the, the crux of the superhero, yeah. The, you know, if we're, we're, if we're going to work in social change and social good, like everyone's like, how are you going to do more good? We're actually working in the problem. We're working in the depths of people's trauma and losses. And so you really need to be able to uh, live the problem and volunteer and get in there and have lots of different people, voices at the table, not just yours and people with lived experience. And I think that that can be really difficult for some people. And I find like the courage to be willing to go there and to sit in those spaces and to own that, that, that reality exists and that we have to acknowledge it and be with it 
and that we can uplift one another through employment by doing that is incredible. Um, so Sheena, I will, I will throw to you on what set of challenges may have emerged uh, that you've maybe faced with social impact hiring um, and how have you guys reconciled that? Right, yeah, so uh, in the early days, um, challenges included just understanding that this isn't a typical co-packer relationship. This is, um, this is a partnership. I, lots of food companies, when they get to a certain size and they engage with a co-packer, they say, I need this much by this date, like the end, you know, they submit a PO, they receive the product on a certain date, and it's just a very basic business transaction for the most part. Um, but for us, you know, I am in constant contact with our production, with the production manager at the flower cart group. Um, she's constantly telling me like, who's in on that day? Or if, you know, a couple of weeks ago, they had a short production week because a bunch of their clients or a bunch of the participants were at um, Special Olympics like soccer tournaments and they had a bunch of folks who were out of, out of, uh, out of the programming for, for different things. And um, flexibility, empathy, these are, these are the, you know, the backbones of the way that our relationship operates with these, um, these social enterprise partnerships. Um, We've had one main organization do, I would say, 99% of our production for the last few years. And we are just now, because of our really rapid growth, we're scaling into a second bar bakery, um, which um, from a brick and mortar perspective, the, the space is perfect. It's got a big kitchen, lots of space for automation, a distribution like space, a loading bay, amazing. Um, but their participants are... A, participants of a different level of, um, of ability than, than what we have at our primary facility. So all brand new SOPs, all brand, brand we're essentially recreating the wheel. We, we have the end product, we have the made with local bar at the end, and we have to work with that, their team to say, okay, how can you create this bar um, with the resources that you have, with the people that you have, and, and they're creating you know, their own way of, of achieving this same product at the end, which is really interesting and not at all efficient. <laughs> um, but it's super rewarding because it's giving um, the opportunity to, to so many folks in this, in this second social enterprise that we're working with to dig in and make it their own um, and, and to grow with us. So there's definitely, definitely unique challenges, but we see them um, not only as something that's helping us build, you know, our business acumen, but I see these innovative models that we've built within our business as a true asset in our company, um, which is, which is pretty amazing. So we've been able to share a little bit about challenges. Now I would love to talk more about the benefits. Like you said, um, there's unique challenges, but it's worth it. Like at the end of the day, it's just so worth it because you know what's what's the outcomes are and what the impact is. So Sarah, can you share a little bit about the benefits that your organization and company have have experienced through social impact hiring? I can. Um, I think there are a couple of layers to uh, that our company has benefited from. Number one, our the people we employ have benefited. And um, just to go back a little bit on Hannah, your very powerful story with Daryl is. I, I, um, firstly, just a couple of things. I want to say, first of all, a lot of the homeless people that we work with are tertiary educated. Um, they're, they're not, you know, I, I remember speaking to one of our clients once and they said, how are we going to be sure that we don't have a, you know, a drunk homeless person lying down in front of the bar in the middle of our conference that, you know, I can assure you that has never happened. Um, what, um, what, uh, you know, we, the, the beneficiaries of our work, um, uh, you know, we trust the people we work with. We pay them from the minute they walk in the door. They don't need any prerequisites. Like you, Hannah, we don't ask them what their journey is. That's, that's their story. When I go to work or turn up to an event, someone doesn't say to me, so tell us your life story. That, that's, that's of no interest. Can you do the job? What is the job? What's required? Let's get to get it done. And what, how much time we got to do this, right? We're going to push ourselves together as a team to deliver. We're going to look at what the everyone's skills are and we're going to say, you know, which bit of this puzzle do you want to do? So I think what we've been able to, to reveal is we've 
allowed people to dig into what they have and we value what it is that they can bring to that event experience. So that's number one. It's re-empowering for them. It allows them to re-identify something as other than homeless. And, you know, our theory is kind of everyone leaves their baggage at the door that morning, including me. We've got a job to do. We do it. And at the end of the day, you pick up your stuff and out you go again, you know. Um, so it has benefited um, our staff, number one. Um, our event clients, um, so we had to push back a little bit because we've been doing this for six years and I know, you know, we're at the bottom of the world here when we were a bit behind things, but to, to, to teach our corporate clients that this was these are social runs on the board, this is social money in the bank that the world doesn't yet value, but in time it will. So we're, we've kind of had to... Um, it started off because I wanted, I wanted to feel good about what I was doing. That's where it started. What I began to realize, and this was partly Sheena through our B Corp accreditation was realizing I need to, it's not good. It's not enough just for me to feel good about this. I have to teach my clients that they should feel good about this. And therefore I need to be, I have need to show them all the data. I need to get some research behind this. Um, so what we've been able to do is, actually um, embed good in our client that they didn't know yet was valuable. Now mm. they see it's valuable and they're pushing up to their boards. And now, as you know, there's this global trend, particularly with the millennials coming up that, that you know, they say to future proof your business, you need to align with your purpose. So we've actually, we've actually allowed our clients to be ahead of the game a little bit in some of these things that are now, now valuable. Um, for, I think they're, the, they're our main two groups. I think the other beneficiary has been the communities in, work, in which we live. Our next step is bringing together our individual event clients because what I've only just come to realise is that we have all these supporters but they don't know they're all supporting us. So our next step is to bring them together and say, we have a really powerful community of supporters here. What if you understood you were all part of Cogs in a Wheel and we could we could unite you to help grow our impact more? You know, and, and where I'm thinking with that is events don't provide long-term uh long-term job outcomes. It's experiential uh, uh, and it's irregular. But what about if we could say through, you know, bringing six event clients together, we could in ask them, could you provide a job outcome for this person? And in this process of teaching transferable skills under the, under the event um, business model, could we could you employ this person at the end for a guaranteed period of time? And that's our end goal. We go straight from homelessness over a short period of time, maybe six to 12 months. And that person then is able to be, uh, have a full-time job. Um, that's our end game. I think that's, that's the future. Front. Yeah. And that's, that is an incredible um, goal to have. And I think also will make the impact even more lasting and, this brings me to what is unfortunately my last que my last question for you guys before we go to the audience questions. So this is a reminder to our our watchers that uh, and viewers that you can ask your questions in the chat box, um, and the team is distilling them for me, and I'll be pulling a couple when we get to the Q and A portion. This last question is for you, Emily. When you think of the impact that you want your business to have, um, both on those that you've employed and those that you're impacting through your product, what does that look like for you? What, what does your legacy for your company look like for you? For me, if I was to have one eternal wish for the world is to empower any, everyone to grow. So not just in the sense of growing fresh produce, but growing yourself and believing that you can grow from a seed into a, a beautiful tomato plant or a head of lettuce. Um, we have worked with youth from across the province from all different backgrounds and circumstances. And many times we're fortunate to be a part of this experience where you watch how they see themselves completely shift. They come in and the idea of working with tools or showing up to work on time feels overwhelming. And a couple months in, they're showing up early. They're showing us ideas on what they think our product can be and finding improvements. And you're seeing that self-confidence, that like evolution of a person happen in front of you. 
So for me, a lot of that happens through agriculture and it happens through growing and watching other things grow. And I think when you're part of watching a plant or a flower or something bloom and grow, you take a little bit of that with you and you start to self-reflect a bit and figure out how you can grow as well. So my eternal wish that I want succeed to have in the world is to truly empower people to grow. Thank you for that, Emily. Um, we have a couple of questions that have rolled in. I'm going to direct these questions to one or two of our panelists just for the sake of time, because I know that we've got about 10 minutes left um, before we need to start wrapping up. Um, so this first one is about a little bit about the nitty gritty, which I very much love story and all of this. So this was something that I'm grateful the audience is asking. Um, are there any specific certification guidelines um, for your social enterprises that you follow? Um, so we did hear about B Corps and the impacts that that have. Um, can you share with us uh, a little bit about that for yourself, Hannah, and the company? Um, are you B Corp certified? Are there other certifications you, you go towards? And what does that mean for you and your business? Yeah, from the very beginning, um, you know, when you go to incorporate your business, the core of it is shareholders are king and that all money is going to shareholders. And so we change our incorporation docs off the get-go so that anyone that invested in Common Good knew that you know we would invest more than half of our profits when we get there, we're scaling, we're not there. Um, but back in, and then the rest is available for shareholder piece. And I think that's an important piece because you know the core of how we build our businesses um, and the natural incorporation documents say something different than what we want to do, right? So we put a lot of that, how we're going to hire. We may have lost uh, Hannah once again. We'll wait for her to join us. I'll roll up the next question so we're ready for it because uh, I have a feeling she'll be back very shortly. Um, the I'm next question, oh, we lost you there, Hannah, for a little bit. Right. We'll just get you to roll just back roll. a little bit. Is it working now? That's weird. Yeah, you're back. Yeah. So if you'd like to continue. Uh, where did I stop off? <laughs> um, I actually got lost in my asking of the next question. <laughs> so let's just pick a random spot. <laughs> yeah, I think that in the end uh, around that, I, I, mean, I think you just really have to look at your business model, what you want to have and those goals. And for us, employment and also the environmental piece is really important to us. We're using biofuel technology uh, and taking food waste and, and heating our water. So for us, it was just looking at our environmental impact and the core of our model and how we hire employees. And that's, that's what we've set it for. Thank you so much, Hannah. Sheena, um, what's the best piece of advice you've ever received in your career um, that you tend to pass on to others when they ask? We're just missing you on your mic there, Sheena. I have a feeling you're working on it. There we go. Yes, I have the whole family here with me now. <laughs> hey, fam. <laughs> this is you, the best. I want you to know, like, I appreciate this so much. <laughs> never a dull moment, honey. I just need a second, okay? Um, sorry, can you repeat the question? I was just trying. Absolutely. To... Um, <laughs> what is the best piece of advice you've, ha you've received in your career um, that you pass on to others when they ask? Yeah, I mean, the biggest thing for me and something that was definitely even fueled further um, in becoming part of the CEO community is that you are never alone. <laughs> I feel like entrepreneurship can feel like extremely isolating and like you're on an island sometimes. And I just have in, in, in being part of the business community out here in Atlantic Canada, which is extremely supportive. And then also joining the CEO network, like the number of times that women who I've never met and don't know at all have gone above and beyond to connect me with the person I needed to talk to or support me in some like very real, tangible, valuable way is it's countless, countless times that's happening so far. So that's my biggest advice is um, that you're not alone and ask for help when you need it. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so I'm actually going to roll this question. Um, across the panel because I think this is a beautiful note for us to end on together. Um, a piece of advice that you've received in your career that you share or pay forward. Um, and we, I think this one is pressing because I can tell by the way that it's phrased, it, it feels very pertinent to this individual. Um, 
how do you deal with doubt and uncertainty? Um, so let's let's add a little bit of an advice question mixed with doubt and uncertainty. What advice do you have for folks who may be feeling doubt and uncertainty when it comes to their business? Um, we'll go to you, Sarah. I think that everyone has doubt and uncertainty. For me, it is really tuning in to instinct um, and what feels what you align with you know it doesn't matter how much advice people give you my deep belief is that internally if this fits for you then you should pursue it and I think the life of a social entrepreneur you know so much about what we do is for so many others irrational or, or impossible um, and you will have if you keep listening you know you probably will become crippled you want you know you won't be able to act I think it's a matter of really understanding deep uh, tuning into what your heart and what your consciousness is telling you and then be brave each morning say just be brave be brave be brave it's crazy but i do it so it's it's self-alignment and emily i'll i'll come to you next what advice do you have so for me this is something that i spent my entire year at ceo working with our, our coach mj on was self-doubt and feeling like I wasn't worthy of what we were doing with succeed or I was the wrong person or I couldn't do it or that this, like I had so much doubt in, in myself. And for me, the shifting point was this, uh, this feeling and just confidence of just stop comparing ourselves to everyone else. So I find so often with business, like take Hannah with a shareholders agreement, most companies will just take what's been done before and click repeat. And that, especially in social entrepreneurship, feels so wrong and it doesn't feel right. So I was going into these rooms and you're seeing the same triangles and squares and I felt like an apple because <laughs> <laughs> how I was and what I believed in and what I wanted to be. So I think in entrepreneurship, you see these ideal figures or businesses or processes that you're supposed to do and that's what seems comfortable in the world so my piece of advice is to get uncomfortable and, and be who you are stop thinking that each path has an a b c d e f g plan and steps that you're supposed to take and yeah it's going to be uncomfortable but embrace it it's better to be yourself and follow your path than trying to replicate or hook on to someone else's thank you so much and hannah you know, for me, it's uh, someone said to me, there's no such thing as a good idea or bad idea. The only thing that matters is activation and community. And he actually used the word execution. I don't like that word. Uh, <laughs> I love activation. And, and I mean, the point is, is like you have to get community around you and you have to look at that idea, that business model and like put it to work. Right. And, and do all of those pieces. So and, and then the other piece is that community piece is that that doubt is that goes away when it will always be there but you when you have key people around you and networks around you like ceo that when things are hard i mean i can send being like even above this podcast i was like i don't know it's been really hard doing social hiring like i don't know right it's so hard and then everyone's like i got you i know it's hard i'm in this with you so you know you need those people around you and then focus on just the activation and show up like just show up in life. Things happen when you show up. It might not be completely what you dreamed of to begin with. I actually predict it will be a lot bigger than what you dreamed of if you just show up. Mm, thank you. I feel like snapping. <laughs> um, so we have about five more minutes than I anticipated. So we're going to do a lightning round across the board. And by lightning, I mean you each will have about a minute to share, which is actually ample time. Um, a little bit about and I asked this of Emily, um, but the legacy piece, um, what do you hope for your legacy around social impact hiring for your business and, and for you personally, um, one or the other, or if they're intertwined, which I often think that they are for social enterprise owners. Sheena, would you like to start? Sure. Um, I mentioned in uh, a couple of questions ago about us seeing this innovative model that we've created in partnership with social enterprise as an asset in our company. And that that asset that we're building, this production model, is something that will be a legacy to the partners that we've worked with. Um, we're, we're in the thick of this right now with our newest um, production partner. 
and the, the rigorous work that they're putting in and that we are supporting them on to get them to scale up to a place where they're not just a little bread bakery that has a training program. They are a full service manufacturing facility for consumer packaged goods. These are services that they will be able to offer other companies and, and use and like reap the benefits of that growth uh, within their internal organization. Um, so I see that as something uh, that that's a real goal for me is that I want the organizations that we partnership to flourish because they've decided to do business with Made With Local. So that's, that's the dream. Yes. And she agrees. <laughs> um, Sarah, would you like to share next? Yeah, you know what, it's a really hard question to answer because I think that um, what we become aware of once we're uh, socially hiring, it's just how big the issue is. Um, and I think, you know, the answers are limitless. Uh, you know, I think I'd like Sheena, Hannah, Emily, um, everyone to come to Adelaide and start their businesses here. Well, we could support them because, you know, that's, with Shio and something like that is not unreasonable, but it takes it takes a whole mindset shift across all sorts of community, all levels of of um, government and corporates uh, uh, to to build an ecosystem that supports everybody. Um, my personal legacy or the legacy of go go i don't know where that's going to go yet you know it's, as i said it's like you just keep seeing more opportunities and go we could do this and we could do this um i suppose that i hope it's a shift in mindset that we're part of the shift in the mindset of 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 business about how things can be done better yeah and i think that's exactly as you shared in your last answer about the long-term employment hopes for for your employees, that that is happening. Yeah. And is that enough? You know, there are other models that like, you know, some of you all have where you set up a business and that's the answer. Um, and that is an awesome answer. Uh, and there are other ways too. And yeah, uh, you know, the mind boggles that the many opportunities that, you know, we could activate to, to change people's lives. It doesn't mm -hmm. seem that hard. To me, and yet it 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 is it's a, it's the challenge of the future. I think. Mm, absolutely, Emily, you shared already about the seeds and how they grow. But is there anything else that you'd like to add here? I think that's the biggest thing. But I just like to add that how overwhelming it is to see all of these comments come in, and so many people relate to the experiences of I guess four businesses, and it, it gives me so much hope to what we can build around the world in the future, and how many more industries and businesses and everything that we can disrupt together. Mm, absolutely. And Hannah? My big vision is to um, embed meaningful social impact back into the fabric of business. And mm -hmm. Common Good Linens is just the first step for us. We are figuring out the models, we're expanding across Canada, but we have plans to have lots of different from Common Good Cleaning to all of that. And then um, you know, like Sarah said before, we're also giving our customers meaningful social impact in their business. The restaurants can say they are hiring people out of poverty by buying something they would already buy and rent, which is linens, right? And so for me, it's like, how do we do this meaningfully? Business is actually created in community. So what, how are we giving and living in community as businesses? And, and I hope that that's, that's my legacy. Mm. Thank you all so much for your time, for your wisdom, for your experience, for your stories. Uh, someone did ask, can every business be a social enterprise? And I think that there are a good number of businesses that can be social enterprises. And if we have that desire, if that is something that pushes us, motivates us, then that's what we can create our businesses into. Um, so thank you everybody for sharing about social impact hiring. And I so love this community that CEO has created doing business differently. And I hope we continue to uh, disrupt, I was about to swear, disrupt all of the industries together. So thank you everybody. And I'll throw it back to Jesse. Thank you so much, Komal. And thank you to our amazing ventures. 
Sheena, Hannah, Sarah, and Emily for sharing your stories, your vulnerable moments, your learnings, and your words of wisdom with us today. Thank you, Komal, for hosting the panel and bringing such heart and thoughtfulness to this conversation. Just wanted to share a couple of comments uh, from the listeners today. Faiza from Mississauga shared, this is the most honest and meaningful discussion I've listened to in a long time. And Rachel Tracy shared, I'm so inspired right now, it's unbelievable. This is just what I needed to make my fire burn a little bit brighter. Thank you all so much for joining us for this important conversation. I just wanted to end on a couple of notes in terms of what's to come. So if you'd like to hear more stories from CEO Ventures around the world who are working on the world's to-do list, we encourage you to check out our newly launched CEO.world podcast, available now everywhere where you might listen to podcasts. Secondly, our 2019 Radical Generosity campaign is launching on September 12th. So what that means is that as of September 12th, women around the world are welcome and encouraged to become CEO activators and also to apply as ventures and become part of this community. Check out our website, www.ceo.world to learn more. And finally, stay tuned for the next Learning Lab. We're coming back to you in October with another edition, and we can't wait to connect with you then. Thank you again to our panelists, to our host, and to everyone for joining. Have a great rest of your day, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Silent waves. <laughs> <laughs>